very much for coming this evening. Welcome from the Motor City, a place where the George Galster string has been alive and well and living for five generations, beginning with my great-great-grandfather in 1851. I'd like to begin the talk by taking you back with me over 300 years to this place as it may have appeared in 1701, because to understand that time is to understand why Detroit was here. This map gives you some sense of its original reason for being. This river, the Detroit River, which connects Lake Erie down there and Lake St. Clair up on the north, was a strategic waterway in 1701 because it was at a time when the French colonies were feeling under threat by those pesky British. And so the French government based in Quebec sent this rather serious looking explorer, one Antoine de La Motte, and his canoe paddling comrades to find a location on the Great Lakes where a fort could be built to stop the pesky British ships from probing the French colony. Well, they found that location right here, and they built a fortification called Fort Pontchartrain, and they named the city around it and the city river right in front of it, Detroit, which in French means the Straits or Narrows, which is the first irony about my hometown because we know it's not been on the Strait and Narrow ever since. <laughs> For this wonderful achievement in geopolitical strategic thinking, Antoine de la Motte was essentially knighted by King Louis XIV's court, and he became the <coughs> Monsieur de Cadillac. Ah, which is also helpful because can you imagine today if you were trying to sell a luxury car by the name of a de la Motte? In any event, that was 1701. Fast forward two centuries later. And this place had been transformed from a military outpost where beaver pelts were being exchanged into a crucible where arguably the most influential durable good of the 20th century was going to be mass produced for the first time in the world. A place where the nascent automobile industry would consolidate and dominate the world for the next half a century, producing unbelievable prosperity that did not just stay in the pockets of the capitalists like Henry Ford, but actually were distributed through the help of the union to a widespread group of the proletariat to make, by 1950, this place one of the most prosperous cities in the world. It would last but a generation. Fast forward another half century, and this place has now become the international poster child for metropolitan dysfunction. How could this have happened? My goal in the book and in my presentation this afternoon is to try to do a diagnosis of this place. Unlike the reams of journalists who have come through Detroit and oohed and odd and its ruins and its weird kind of vignettes, I want to get below the surface and understand why. I want to try to do an MRI, if you will, of this metropolitan area and see what lurks behind the skin. Let me tell you the formation of my argument right up front. I'm actually going to start my analysis of Detroit from an unusual position in urban studies. I hope you found it attractive, provocative. It's a position based, of all things, on human psychology. And I'm going to argue that fundamental human needs of metropolitan Detroit citizens, which I'm going to encapsulate in the term respect, have been systematically frustrated by three fundamental elements of our metropolitan area. What I'm going to call the economic engine of anxiety, the housing disassembly line, that's not a typo, disassembly line, and the dual dialectic of power struggles. These three frustrating features, I will argue, have led Detroiters to make adaptations to get respect in one way or another, either individually or collectively. Ironically and perversely, these adaptations, which have taken the form of oppositional identity formation and scapegoating, and collective adaptations of unionization, segregation, political fragmentation, and identity politics, have led to an unwanted outcome an outcome that I call collective irrationality, and have created the dysfunctional metropolis that we have today. So that's the core of my argument. If you'd like to take a half hour nap, 
and come back at the end, you will not have missed a thing. But if you want to stay with me, I think you'll enjoy the journey. What do Detroiters want? Well, let me at the beginning make sure that you understand my use of language. When I shorthand the word Detroit or Detroiters, I really mean people in the entire region. Because my story is not about just the city, it's about the region. It's the regional perspective that's crucial for all of this. So citizens of our metropolis, I think like citizens of most metropolitan areas, essentially are out to try to obtain, retain, and expand, if possible, three categories of resources. First, physical resources. Second, social resources. And third, psychological resources. Now, instead of talking about all of these things separately and using a lot of words, I'm going to bundle these things under a term that I'm simply going to call the quest for respect. In all academic honesty, I need to cite my sources. I borrowed this term respect from Detroit's most famous sociologist, Aretha Franklin. <laughs> you may recall this song and the lyrics therein. What you may not have recalled is the fact that in 1967, one month after Aretha's respect hit number one on the American pop music charts, the city of Detroit broke out in the most destructive race riot in the nation's history. Coincidental? I don't think so. All right, so we're out to get respect. Unfortunately for us, we're in the wrong place. Because our metropolitan area has for generations frustrated us in three fundamental ways. First of all, because of our economic engine of anxiety, which is a dependence upon an oligopolistic industry that's producing a durable good. And I'll expand on what that means in just a second. Secondly, a particular way that we're building our neighborhoods, what I'm going to call the housing disassembly line, whose key feature is perpetual excess construction of housing built primarily on the suburban fringe. Key excess construction, more than we need. And last but not least, the dual dialectic of power struggles. One dimension is power struggles between black and white. It's a racial dimension. The other is between big labor and big capital. It's a class struggle. And I would suggest if you think about those dimensions as coordinates on a Cartesian plane, that you can pretty much tell somebody's life chances in Metro Detroit by in which quadrant they define themselves. All right, let me unpack each one of these pieces of the argument. The economic engine of anxiety. Our economy today, as it has been for over 100 years, is still fundamentally based on one export industry, the automobile industry. That, unfortunately, is an industry that is creating a great deal of economic insecurity for two ways. Number one, we have cyclical instability. And number two, we have a long-term decline in employment that the industry is creating. The cyclical instability is due to the fact that basically we're producing a durable good. And durable goods, we know, are subject to big swings in the business cycle. When times are great, people celebrate by buying a new car. Detroiters are happy. When times are bad, people conserve by driving their old car for several extra years. Detroit's very unhappy. So the national business cycle may do this over time, ups and downs. Metro Detroit's business cycle does this over time in terms of its ups and downs. Great deal of cyclical instability, which makes the workforce directly employed and, of course, indirectly employed by the industry very insecure. A long-term problem, of course, is that the industry has been generating, even in good times, fewer jobs than it did before due to automation, outsourcing to foreign countries, lots of other reasons that I won't go into right now, but to give you some kind of sense of how much change in employment the auto industry and related firms have created over time, the manufacturing jobs actually within the city of Detroit have virtually evaporated in the last half a century. In 1947, right at the end of World War II, we had 333,000 manufacturing jobs within the city, primarily associated with the auto industry. The most recent economic census had it down to 23,000. The second problem with the auto industry is that it's socially and psychologically threatening to our workforce. How many folks have actually done assembly line work in this audience? Very few. Yeah, well, I have too. Was it a lot of fun, Peter? 
Terrible. Exactly. Uh, at, at best, it's dehumanizing, de-skilling, monotonous. It can be sometimes dangerous. Uh, it's, it's not pleasant. To give you some kind of sense, in a vignette about how corrosive this kind of industry can be for line workers, let me tell you about the case of one James Johnson. James Johnson was a black auto worker who was employed at the Chrysler factory on Eldon Avenue on the east side of Detroit. And in 1971, he finally had had enough. For years, he had been abused by the foreman on this assembly line, and he blew his top. And in classic American style, when you get mad at your employer, well, what do you do? Yeah, exactly. He went out and he bought a rifle, brought it back to the factory, shot his foreman, and shot two others to make it a trifecta. He peacefully surrendered, of course, was charged with murder. In a stroke of brilliance, his defense attorney had the judge and jury come to the Eldon Avenue factory to see the conditions under which James Johnson was working. Their verdict? Not guilty for reasons of insanity. Literally proving in a court of law that working on an auto line can drive you crazy, even so far as to murder. So that's our economic base. Let's talk about our second frustration, <laughs> our housing disassembly line. Basically, what we've been doing in our region is having speculative development on the suburban fringe, which has been far in excess of regional household formation. To put it in less fancy terms, we've been building more houses than there have been households to fill them. Now the new ones that are built, oh, they get filled all right, but ultimately some houses are left vacant. Let me build the sequence logically for you and then I'll provide the evidence in a minute. This excess supply is going to lead to a chain of moves which ultimately is going to vacate the least competitive housing anywhere in the metropolitan area. Now, to illustrate this absolutely crucial principle, I have hand-selected three volunteers in the audience who will now join me up here in these chairs. No, no, no. Only three, please. I know it's a popular thing. Thank you. No, you don't have, no, I don't need you on this one, Senator. I might need you for something else. Now, these three volunteers are going to represent archetypical households living in archetypical houses in archetypical neighborhoods. Now, Liz, you happen to be in a neighborhood that's representing the oldest neighborhood in the least attractive house <coughs> happens to be in an older Detroit neighborhood, in the city of Detroit, okay? And you, sir, you are in a house which is kind of middle quality in an inner ring suburb. And you, lucky you, you're on the newest, most desirable house, most recently built on the fringe of the Detroit metropolitan area. All right, three houses in three neighborhoods all occupied by a lovely household. No problem, until I come along. I'm the developer, and guess what I do? Hey, I have a new house. I'm gonna build at the edge of my metropolitan area. And because we know Detroiters like the newest model, look at the cars we buy, they like the newest model house as well. And so I convince you, wouldn't you love to live in this house? It's got great granite countertops, it's got great high status neighborhoods, new refrigerator, you've got nature out your back door, and you know, psst, also a little farther away from them. <laughs> so you're gonna want my house, right? So you move over to this house. The developer takes the money, walks away, and starts building the next one. But you, of course, you need to sell your house to buy this one, so you sell it and give the same line to this guy. And you, oh sure, let's move it, please move up. This is a better situation for you, so I'll move up. He's got the same situation. He has to sell his house. Well, this you have to move here, because you view this as a move up for you. And now the owner of this house goes, well, I'd like to have this sold to literally nobody. There's only three households. There's four houses. One has to be vacant. And this is the one that's going to be vacant. Well, what happens to a vacant house if it sits vacant for years and years? And nobody's going to buy it because they know it's going to be vacant for years and years. Well, a rational owner is not going to maintain it. And eventually, they're going to walk away from it. They eventually will abandon this house. It literally 
will be out of the housing market. It will be gone. It'll be left as an abandoned hulk. It might have an accidental fire so they can collect the insurance. It might be home for squatters and drug dens, and maybe the city will eventually demolish it to create a vacant lot. It will be gone. Thank you, three volunteers. Give them a hand. Weren't they great households? <laughs> well, the process doesn't stop there, because those people and those dwellings were part of the tax base of the city of Detroit. Clearly, if you are taxing those properties and that property disappears, there's no property tax going to be collected on that long gone house. That person is not going to be in the city anymore, so you're not going to get any income tax revenue out of that person. Your tax base is eroding. You have this unenviable choice of either raise the percentage of tax rate that you charge everybody left in your city, or you cut back the quality of your public services, or you do both. If you do either, you're just going to create more demand for suburban housing because people want to get the heck out of town. It's a less competitive place to live and work. All of that, of course, just perpetuates the urban disassembly line. And hopefully now you can see my metaphor of a disassembly line. All these houses were lined up in a row, as if on a conveyor belt. A conveyor belt. Another house is added to one end of this conveyor belt. Everything else kind of chug chug slips a little bit farther until this house falls off the end of the belt into ruin. All the way along this disassembly line, of course, there are huge financial, social, and psychological costs being paid by owners and residents. When I was cleverly picking up these people and moving them, that was easy here on the stage, but in real neighborhood terms, think of what was going on here. From the perspective of people in each one of these neighborhoods, other people were coming in, but the only reason they could come in is because the, one of the previous residents was trying to sell their house off cheap and allow those people to come in who previously could not have afforded to get into this neighborhood. So eventually, somewhat lower income than the original residents were going to be coming in. And eventually, God forbid, they might even be in a different neck. So that creates a whole bunch of financial and psychological strains because Detroiters love to define themselves by who they live with and who they don't live with. Plus, all these owners who have these properties are clearly suffering financially because this excess supply that the developer really nearly dropped into the picture is keeping their values down and thus limiting the amount of home appreciation that they can get when they sell their homes whenever. So this housing disassembly line is another great source of disrespect. All right, there is my argument. Now let me bring some evidence to bear. I've argued that there's new construction in excess of regional household formation. Now I'm going to show you a number that you're going to think is a typo. It isn't. For the last 60 years, our metropolitan region every year on average has produced 10,000 more houses than there were households to fill them, thereby rendering redundant approximately 10,000 houses someplace else in the metropolitan area. Where? In the least competitive neighborhoods. Where? In the city of Detroit. I argue that it leads to under-maintained vacant and abandoned buildings in Detroit. Is that true? Oh, yeah. 30% of the land area in the city of Detroit is now vacant land. Approximately the same area of land as constitutes Manhattan. I've argued that that would erode the city's income and property tax revenues and the quality of its public services. Well, our assessed values of all properties in our city limits had dropped 79% since its peak in 1958. Our income tax revenues have dropped 76% since they reached their peak in 1972. And if you've been paying attention, we've been bankrupt since July of last year with approximately $18 billion in debt. And lastly, I argued that that would ultimately lead to more demand for suburban housing as people who could leave Detroit would leave Detroit. Has that come true? Oh, yeah. Detroit has lost over 60% of its population since its peak approximately 1950. 
Oh, those are cold, hard statistics. It looks like this on the ground. I took this picture about one mile away from where I currently live. Does that make me a little insecure? Hell yes. How long has that been? Oh, uh, before I moved to Detroit in 1996, I took this picture in 2008. It's now a vacant lot because they bulldozed it since, but it's a beautiful ruin, isn't it? Has this right. also occurred with office space? I would assume in mm -hmm. other buildings that you to the suburbs that you have vacant office space? Absolutely. Retail yeah. and all kinds of non-residential right. abandonment has accompanied the residential. Right. Mm -hmm. The last frustrating feature is the dual dialectic along race and class lines. This story is worth many lectures on its own. Let me just come to the punchline. Both stories involve sordid histories of violence across race and class lines. The picture here is the famous mural of the working conditions in the River Rouge factory of Henry Ford, painted by Diego Rivera on the walls of the Detroit Institute of Arts in 1932. One of the works of arts that are currently being assessed by those who want to sell off this art collection to pay off the city's debt. Nineteen thirty seven was an interesting year in Detroit's history. In February of that year, the nascent United Auto Workers Union had found its nuclear option. They found their most powerful weapon in their war against big capital. It was called the sit-down strike. Instead of leaving the factory and picketing around the edge, where the cops and the company goons could beat them to a pulp, they said, hey, let's just sit down amid the machines, lock everybody else out of the factory, and be warm and secure relatively in the factory. That turned the tide. And so in 1937, a miraculous year, all the big companies were organized in Detroit by the United Auto Workers, except one, the Ford Motor Company. And so at the end of 1937, Walter Ruther, the head of the local UAW at that point, yet to become national president, and his colleagues went to an overpass that connected the employee parking lots to the River Rouge complex. They were going to stand on that overpass and hand out leaflets encouraging the workers to organize and vote for United Auto Workers, sort of like what's happening right now at the Volkswagen factory. Except they were met not by their rights to First Amendment, freedom of speech, but by the goon squad, euphemistically called the service department <laughs> by Henry Ford. They provided services all right, who, as you can see, built, uh, beat the union organizers to a pulp. Unfortunately, though, they won the war, uh, won the battle. They didn't win the war because the press photographer here was able to capture these photographs and wire them across so that newspapers across the United States could show <laughs> these kinds of acts of corporate brutality. And the public relations started to turn against Henry Ford, but it would still be four long, violent years before the United Auto Workers gained recognition from the Ford Motor Company. How about on terms of the racial dimensions of our metropolitan area? Well, again, a few <coughs> strategic facts, I think, tell our story. To get some sense of the violent racial history of our place, I simply have to go back and tell you about the, night, the 1833 Detroit race riot. I almost said 19, but it really is 18. Followed by the 1863 race riot, the 1943 race riot, and the 1967 race riot. Metro Detroit is the national champion in being the American city for which federal troops had to be called out the most times to quell a race riot, four times in our history. Nobody else comes close. Twice is the nearest any other city comes. To give you some sense of the animosity that these events engendered and expressed, I'm going to be quiet for a moment and let you see some pictures. This is 1943. Mm -hmm. 
public transit in Detroit has never been the same. Fast forward, quarter of a century. This is not Berlin in 1945. Well, these days, we don't explicitly kill each other in the streets anymore. We have evolved our race struggles into a geographic stalemate. A stalemate where basically we have a black city and a white suburb. And these race and class lines follow each other. So it's a poor city and a relatively rich suburban area that we're talking about as well. To give you some kind of visual portrait of the way that the race class tensions play themselves out in urban space today, let me take you on a historical journey through the racial geography of Detroit. Take 1950. This is a city of Detroit schematic. Let me explain some of the weird parts of this. Uh, the blue item here is Belle Isle Park. That's why nobody lives there. The large open sections in the middle are actually two separate municipalities, Highland Park and Hamtramck. that are completely encircled by the city of Detroit, so we're not counting them for the moment. The rest are simply the city outlines. The Detroit River is the, the lower border here. Canada is down here. By the way, this gives you a great little tidbit you can use at the next cocktail party. What's the only place in the United States where you look south to see Canada? Answer, Detroit. They'll never guess it. The racial geography, very simple. If I code it green, it's a majority black neighborhood. Yellow, a majority white neighborhood. 1950, the majority black neighborhoods are constrained very clearly by Woodward Avenue. That's that line that very clearly demarcates a western boundary to the black neighborhoods, where Detroiters would call these black neighborhoods Black Bottom. Isn't that a complimentary name? Watch how the racial geography changes decade to decade. Some people like to watch the green areas expand. Personally, my favorite is to watch the yellow areas contract. You choose. 1960, 70, 80. Ooh, new color. Majority Hispanic, primarily Mexican origin. So immediately Detroiters called that neighborhood, guess what? Mexican town. We call it like it is. And the latest, 2010. Oh, where, oh, where have those white folks gone? Oh, I see. They went to the metropolitan area. Expand the scale of the map a little bit. It's pretty clear where the city of Detroit is. Yeah, there are a couple of suburban areas. Southfield, immediately north of the city. Pontiac, a little bit farther up, which are, have majority black neighborhoods, but by and large, this is a situation of white suburbs and a black city. To give you some sense of this racial polarization, guess for me, please. What is the percentage of all white people living in this big metropolitan area, 4.3 million people, who actually have their residence within the city of Detroit? The percentage of all white people in this area who have their residence within the borders of the city of Detroit. Answer? Four percent. Well, that's the racial dimension. Not too shockingly, there's a class dimension to it as well. Same basic picture, but now the scale is different. I'm looking at poverty rates. The darker the shading, the heavier the poverty rate in that neighborhood. With the darkest shading, the dark brown areas being over 25% officially below the poverty line in that neighborhood. Again, I've outlined the city very clearly so you can see it. If this is an obvious picture of concentration of poverty in one jurisdiction, I don't know what there is. Now there's one place in the city of Detroit that I think is the perfect icon of this dual dialectic. It is the Packard Complex, located on the east side of Detroit, 
right off of Interstate 94. This is what it looks like today. It is a massive ruin stretching almost a half a mile. It didn't always <laughs> look this way. In fact, it was producing up until 1956 a wonderful automobile that looks like this, a Packard, a luxury car of its day. It ultimately couldn't compete, went out of business, but in its day, this complex was a wonder of Detroit. This shows it in the early 1940s. And during this period, 1943, it was a key keystone, if you will, in the arsenal of democracy in Detroit because this factory was cranking out aircraft engines. But this factory, like all the others in Detroit in the middle of World War II, was having a labor challenge because a lot of folks were going overseas and they were having to pull non-traditional labor sources into these factories. So industrial recruiters went from Packard Motor Car Company to the Deep South and recruited essentially rural farm folk, both black and white, to come to Detroit to work here. Now, you can imagine the social challenges already of having rural folks in a major city horribly overcrowded and working in <laughs> extreme duress conditions in a major factory. Except there's an addition problem, is that, of course, they're coming from a social structure which is legally segregated. We're talking about de jure, Jim Crow style segregation in the Deep South in this era. And now these folks are being moved from a context where they're told where they can go to the bathroom, where they can sit on the bus, where they can sit in the movie theaters, where they go to school, where they can live, and they're being thrown into the city of Detroit where none of these rules apply, at least officially, and into a factory where they maybe do or do not apply. Can imagine the social tension? The management was not ignorant about this social tension, and so they in most factories, rigidly segregated the workforce, giving, of course, the more prestigious, higher paying jobs to the white folks and the other ones to the black folks. The management of this particular factory was still smarting from the relatively recent union organizing drive by the United Auto Workers. So they had a brilliant idea about how to get back at the union. They were going to play the race division card. So what they did is they promoted three black workers from the maintenance department to the then white-only assembly line. They got the reaction they were expecting. 20,000 white workers marched out of this factory on a wildcat strike. Unsanctioned, the United Auto Workers hierarchy told them to go back to work. They responded with a rude gesture. The White House called and said, get back to work. We need your production. Same response. For days, tens of thousands of white workers encircled this huge complex, being harangued by incredible rhetoric. I need to quote just a fragment of that incredible rhetoric so that you get a sense of what was going on. I need to give you a disclaimer at the beginning. It is offensive. But you'll see why I need to say it. The leader of this white hate strike was quoted as saying the following, I would rather have Hitler and Hirohito win the war than work next to a nigger, unquote. So in Detroit, my friends, racism can trump class solidarity. It can trump union solidarity. How it can even trump patriotism. So, what have I said so far? I have argued that if you want to understand Metro Detroit, you have to start with psychological principles, and you have to look at how our basic quest for physical, social, and psychological resources, this quest for respect, has been systematically frustrated by three features of our metropolitan area. The way we earn a living, the way we produce our neighborhoods, and the way we struggle from power along race and class lines. I argue that all of these features create huge insecurities in our livelihoods, in our neighborhoods, in our home values, in our social status, in our self-esteem, and even our personal safety. Metro Detroit is a place that deeply disrespects the individual. It gives us a punch in the gut every single day. This statue 
is located at the core of our center business district, in the most prominent place where every visitor to the city is going to see it. Supposedly, it celebrates the boxing prowess of Detroit's own Joe Lewis, who in the 1930s was the world champion. I think it signifies so much more about our metropolitan area. So what? So we live in a frustrating metropolitan area. Well, we're Detroiters. We don't take these things lying down. We're going to get respect somehow. We're going to find some way to get these resources, and so we adapt. First of all, we adapt our own brains. I think that we uniquely adapt our own brains in two ways. First of all, we are big at oppositional identity formation. By that, I mean that we define ourselves not by who we are, but who we are not. I'm not quite sure who I am, but I'm sure better than you. And, oh, I'm certainly better than you. And you back there, much better than your group. Now, that kind of attitude has a consequence. It makes you think of the world in zero-sum terms. I can't let you get ahead. I can't let you ever win, because if you do that, it means I lose. You're getting closer to me in status, or maybe if you're already ahead of me in status, I'm getting further behind you in relative terms. So I can't think of a win-win. It's always a you win, I lose equally. Now to illustrate this principle of a zero-sum mentality, I have to go back to Councilman Alonzo Bates, a city councilor who in 2005 was part of the city council who was interviewing a white developer who was petitioning city council to buy at fair market price some of the vast amounts of vacant land that the city owns by default. The developer wanted to build a market rate new housing development, not in the suburban fringe, but in the city of Detroit. You'd think city council would be overjoyed, would kiss this guy's whatever part of the anatomy you wanted. But no, 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 no. Councilman Bates says, why can't there be somebody who looks like me sitting in that chair? Oh, I know why. Now that the city is worth something, you white folks want to take it back from us. The second thing that we do individually is we scapegoat. I've argued that our metropolitan area creates all these deep psychological insecurities. Well, if you're a little bit short on self-esteem, are you going to look in the mirror and see the source of the problem? Oh, no. You're going to find the source of the problem out there someplace. And both, I think, black and white groups in Metro Detroit do this. What they particularly excel at is a game that I call space rape accusations. I mean that both groups blame the other for violating their sacred territory. Here's how white folks would explain this game. Oh, you know, Chuck, I was just down to the old neighborhood in Detroit last weekend to drive around, see what it was like. Oh, my god. The house where I grew up is just a ruin. The place where my mother was born, it's a vacant lot. Everything in the neighborhood looks like it's gone to hell. Those <laughs> black people have let the city go to hell. They've taken these sacred sites, my special childhood memories, and they've trashed them. They've raped my place. Here's how black folks play that game. The going got tough in the 1960s. You guys ran away. You took all your money, all your investments. You left the place. You abandoned us. You're the white folks who at your proper little cocktail parties out there in the suburbs brag about how many years it's been since you set foot in the city of Detroit. It's your fault. You've raped the city of Detroit, not us. We've also adapted collectively. We found that a way to get our resources is through collective action. So if we've got to fight big capital, some of the biggest firms in the world, like General Motors was, we need a big freaking union to get it as a countermeasure. And so not only the auto industry is unionized, but Detroit metro area remains one of the most intensely unionized places in the United States. For heaven's sakes, 
Wayne State University is unionized. Not just the faculty, but five different unions represent different parts of the university workforce, including, God forbid, the graduate assistants. <laughs> Segregation. American schools and American neighborhoods we know are generally segregated along racial lines, but America hasn't seen anything until they've seen Detroit. By most measures, our neighborhoods and our schools are the most highly segregated by race of any place in the nation. And again, that makes sense if you're coming from it from the perspective of respect. If you're defining who you are by who you live with and who your kids go to school with, you can't let them into your neighborhood. You can't let them go to school with Johnny and Jill because what does that say about you? Fragmentation. Our metropolitan area is cut up into 221 local governments, all given great powers by the Michigan State Constitution. This is, on average, a political jurisdiction for every about 21,000 people. This is a tiny box government place. Again, why? It makes sense. If you're looking for control, some sense of power over your destiny, you want a small political jurisdiction so your vote's going to count. So maybe you even know personally your representative. Go, go to coffee with them. And last but not least, we are masters at identity politics. By identity politics, I mean a politics that appeals not to ideology, not to policy rationale. It appeals to a deep sense of whether this candidate is like you. A really good player at this is former Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick who was running for re-election for his second term as mayor in 2005. Now, in his first term, there was a whiff of scandal. This would later become a stench, but at this point, it was a whiff of scandal. And so he was behind in the polls, seriously behind in the early political polls, to a challenger, one Freeman Hendricks, another black man who had been deputy mayor under the previous mayor, Dennis Archer, was very well qualified, well spoken, definitely a serious candidate. Well, Hendricks was clobbering Kilpatrick in the early polls. Well, what's Kilpatrick going to do? Hmm, I'll play the race card. Wait a minute. Kilpatrick's black, Hendricks is black. How is Kilpatrick going to play the race card? Well, he did his background reading, and he did digging into the uh, genealogy of Mr. Hendricks and found that Mr. Hendricks was the byproduct of a union of a black American soldier and a white German woman when the senior Hendricks was stationed in Germany after World War II. Aha, Kwame Kilpatrick has his campaign issue. Vote for the real black man, the 100% pure blood black man, not that half-breed challenger. Now Kwame wasn't quite as blatant about it as I was. They didn't need to be. He got the message across in a much more subtle but effective way. From that point on, Kwame's campaign never referred to his opponent as Freeman or as Hendricks. No, no, no. By the previously unknown first name, which had been just an initial, if it had been anything. From that point on, it was Kwame versus Helmut. <laughs> Kwame won going away and spent most of his second term in jail.